my advice when I speak and coach with entrepreneurs is so much around just, you know, even if the business sucks, it doesn't mean that you suck, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and to really recognize that they need to take care of themselves first and foremost. And if they aren't doing well, then their startup isn't going to do well. In part one of my conversation with Susan Stevens, the founder and CEO of WeSpire, she talked about how our company combines the interactivity of social media and the fun of game mechanics to help people live better. In the second part of our conversation, Susan discusses some of the immense challenges of running a startup, especially as a woman and a parent. She also gives some important advice on how to develop a realistic path towards growth for your company, and it may not always involve you at the helm. Susan, I'm excited to continue our conversation and, and really hear now how you have grown and evolved over the past 10 years. I'm sure you've run into a few challenges over that, that time period. Uh, what's um, an insight, a learning that you could share to another uh, leader that they would have to go through as well and that they could get, glean an insight from what you've gone through. That could be having to go through a, a pivot, a change, how to, to acquire your first couple of clients. What kind of insight can you share of this from this journey that you've been on? Sure, so I was an entrepreneur right after 9-11 and I actually lost my startup uh, in the wake of 9-11. We were a New York City based startup and you know, I started this company right in the middle of the Great Recession. I would describe this ride for the last 10 years as you know, one of the most advanced roller coasters ever. You definitely needed to be five foot five and certainly couldn't be pregnant <laughs> you know, for, to survive this roller coaster. Um, but, so, but I think the most important thing I've learned from all of that in entrepreneurship has been the importance of separating your own personal identity from your, your company and your business. And I think one of the things entrepreneurs do that makes us incredibly passionate and powerful, but may be Achilles, an Achilles heel, is that we don't separate our identities. We are our businesses and therefore how the business is doing is how we feel that we are doing, um, which causes us to have anxiety, um, sleepless nights, um, you know, a lot of lack of confidence, self-confidence issues, you know, um, entrepreneurs have higher alcoholism rates, divorce rates, suicide rates. And I think a lot of that is this inability to separate their personal identity from, uh, you know, from, from the business. And so I think my, my advice when I speak and coach with entrepreneurs is so much around just, you know, even if the business sucks, it doesn't mean that you suck, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and to really recognize that they need to take care of themselves first and foremost. And if they aren't doing well, then their startup isn't going to do well. And that health and well-being. Um, maintaining perspective and keeping a sense of humor, you know, having at least one interest in your life besides your startup, um, you know, and I think one of the most important things for me in, in We Spire over the last 10 years is that I started it um, as a mother, um, you know, and so I had, when I started it, a, um, you know, uh, gosh, he was, two and six, you know, um, year old. And so I had no choice but to ensure that I stayed engaged um, and, you know, had another responsibility and had another interest. Um, and that didn't make it easy, um, but it certainly made, I'm not sure there's anything else you could prioritize, um, you know, more than a business than perhaps your kids. And so it made it, made it easier. You are, you are wonderful then testament to be able to run a successful business and have uh, kids and a family life and to stay we well being in your own mind. That's, that's powerful. Yeah. And there's been, you know, ups and downs on that for sure. You know, you have to work hard at it. You can't take it for granted and, you know, um, and you know, you have to learn the habits and the patterns that are going to work for you and not everybody's the same. Um, mine happens to be that I love to get on a bike in the dark with 60 other people and pedal my heart out. Um, I'm missing that immensely right now. <laughs> and I've had to find other ways to do that, um, you know, for others. And I, and I love to dance and do that. Um, for others, it may be painting. For others, it may be, you know, another form of exercise, uh, you know, but you've got to find your outlet 
um, and your identity separate from your company. And I think that's particularly true when, if and when you choose to raise venture capital, because one of the things you learn is that, yes, you are the founder, but ultimately they are the boss. And, you know, um, many, many founders get removed uh, as the CEO, um, you know, by investors. And, you know, if you've spent your whole life thinking you are the company, it leaves you really, really bereft, even if that might be what's best for your vision. The necessity of separating yourself from the company is paramount to your own well-being and health and the future of the business itself. Exactly. And being able to know, you know, hey, maybe the problem is me. You know, and that it's time, if this business is going to achieve what it, it needs to achieve, maybe the best thing to do is to, to bless someone else with this next phase. Um, and how you figure that out is really challenging. My advice is to surround yourself with amazing mentors, a really strong board, um, and be willing to ask the question of your team um, so that you're hearing and getting the feedback you need. As you have scaled over the years uh, and grown, is there any tactic, tactical advice that you can share of? What does it take? What can you do? What have you done to scale uh, the, your clients and, and the business? Yeah, my best advice is to stay incredibly close to your customers. Um, most of our growth has come by really listening to what customers needed, problems customers needed solving that weren't getting solved effectively and wasn't necessarily just about how we were doing today. I think it's very, people think customer focus means that you ask them, you know, would you, uh, you know, recommend our product or service on a scale of zero to 10? And I, listen, I'm a big believer in net promoter. It's an important thing to, to measure. But more importantly is tell me how you're doing and how's the business doing and what's keeping you up at night and what problems are you looking to solve? And that's one of the things that when we really feedback solve, loop. yeah, that feedback loop that's bigger than you, mm -hmm. you know, as a business, because what I really saw in that, if I had been, you know, it's sort of, it gets a little into, you know, what um, Henry Ford said, if I'd asked my customers what I want, they would have said a faster horse, you know? So if you keep asking, like, in conjunction with what I do today, what do you need? You're going to get one piece of data. But if you ask them, you know, what problems are you looking to solve? What is keeping you up at night? What's worrying you? What you may learn is what an opportunity is. And by having those conversations with our customers, what we learned quickly was some of them were really, really worried about losing their jobs um, because they saw this convergent happening and they didn't have the skill set or the talent or the familiarity or the ability to do X and mm -hmm. saw that there was this was happening. And so one of the things we could do is by developing that capability and be able to make them look really skilled and talented in this, they would bring us in a partner and be able to you know, be able to demonstrate to the organization mastery in this area. Um, and that was helpful. Did you uh, personally do this? Did you have a team of people that you had distributed to? And did it happen like, at, when did it happen to have this feedback loop and connection with them? How did you yeah. execute? So that? we've always invested disproportionately and always over benchmarks uh, in customer success. And we've always hired people in customer success who are um, very skilled um, and very talented. And you know, my right-hand person in the organization is my head of customer success. Um, and I think I took that approach because I knew from having been on the buyer side that technology doesn't win or lose based on features and functionality. Technology wins or loses based on whether it's delivering value to you know, an organization. And, the only way you know that is if you're talking enough to the people about the value they're getting. Um, and you can't talk about value that they're getting and, and more and have that relationship unless you've established a cadence for that communication. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes a lot of technology companies have is they, you know, they sell their technology, they implement their technology, and then they, you know, come back once a year. I mean, we're on the phone with our clients every week. Um, you know, we do quarterly business reviews. We have, you know, regular roundtables to get their feedback and hear what's on their mind. And I, and I think that has helped us navigate a very changing dynamic in the market that we operate in um, and in this world. Wow. 
for you personally, um, any books or podcasts or audiobooks that you can recommend that have helped you as a leader and innovate and keep innovating? Yeah. So, um, I, I, interestingly enough, there's, um, the next big idea book club is something that one of our advisors, Adam Grant has formed with Daniel Pink and some others. And it's a set of books that arrive quarterly that are on leadership, um, self-improvement, you know, all these things. And I just find that those books in general are excellent. Um, you know, and so um, like right now, one is on successful aging. It's just fascinating to read. And so it's a nice variety, I learn a ton um, and feel like there's all these, you know, resources to, you know, podcasts and, and web conferences and things like that that are really cool around it. Um, and then as an entrepreneur, I love how I built this. I, and I think the thing that I love most about how I built this is I realized that the trials and tribulations that I have been through are pretty similar to the trials and tribulations that the vast majority of entrepreneurs go through. And what's funny is that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurial media, media is so focused on funding rounds because in the early days, it's really the only thing a company really announces. Um, customers won't let you announce that you just signed this big customer and, you know, all of this. And so the world gets so focused in entrepreneurship on the stories of financing and sort of the, you know, you know, what Zoom has done in 10 years or Slack has done in 10 years or things like that. And, you know, you don't hear about Tate's Bake Shop and how, you know, she started, um, you know, on her father's farm and then built it up and then lost it all and had to rebuild again. And, you know, those are the motivating stories to me that just, um, you know, uh, I think the, the Winston Churchill quote is one of my favorites. When you're going through hell, just keep going. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.